Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game. And we will be doing lots of politics and public policy this evening because we're blessed to have State Rep. Jim Durkin. He's a man of well, tremendous experience. He first got elected to the House, the State House, 1995. After being there for seven years, they let him out, let him out of the House, so to speak, so he could run for the U.S. Senate. He was the Republican nominee. Everybody remembers that very tight race in 2002. It wasn't as tight as uh, you think it was. Well, it should have been tight, okay. Yeah. He had the backing of John McCain, right? Oh, yeah, old friends, still good friends. All right. And um, in any case, after four years of being a good boy, and he didn't get in any trouble, they let him come back into the House, right? That's 2006. Correct. That's correct. Now he's still... Seven years later, he's starting to get in trouble. He may have to be exiled again for a few years, or are you going to stay there? Oh, well, it's, uh, you know, it, it may be more specific. Here. All right, so look, we're not going to screw around here. We're going to get right to the show because Durkin knows a lot about the state employee pension mess. We're going to be talking about that as well as other things. But let's start right there. We're taping the show, Jim, on March 23rd, the year 2013. And it sounds like, you know, state employee pension reform, to everybody's surprise, passed out of the House just two days ago, right? That's correct. It finally, I think there's some progress being made. It was made. bipartisan. It was basically equal proportions of Democrats and Republicans who supported this pension reform bill, which was basically the Neckritz bis bill. Is that right? Neckritz. I would say, you know, let's, let's, Tom Cross, Elaine Neckritz, Dan Biss. Okay. Tom Cross is the Cross, one who started Neckritz. this three years ago, who really is the one that said he our pension it. systems he gets are going to collapse. He's been in every negotiation, okay. but a lot of the concepts that we're passing are, are, are very similar to what he's been advocating for the last two, three years. So tell our viewers, what does this bill do? Does it cure the $100 billion underfunding problem, or does it just make a down payment on that? No, it does, and we need the it Senate. It does cure it, or it makes a down it payment? It will cure it. Okay. It will cure it. We need the Senate to support what we had passed out on Wednesday. Uh, there are three different components to what the House has passed that are extremely important to stabilizing the public pension systems. Uh, first of all, the cost of living adjustments. Uh, we can no longer uh, sustain the growth with the COLAs. Right now it's a 3%. That's what these folks just only interrupt say COLA. That's, of course, short for cost of living adjustment. That's where the, that's that's where the money is. At. That's where the money is. If you want to have state employee pension reform, you've got to cut back on the COLA. If you're talking to somebody who's a politician and they're talking about they favor state employee pension reform, and the first thing they say is not to adjust the COLA, make it substantially less, they're not getting at the problem. Do I have that right, Jim? That's correct. Right now, the Illinois law allows, it, it guarantees, uh, or at least, by statute, a compound of 3% COLA. Which is a hand. lot, it's because a, inflation has been like 1 or 1.5%. Correct. And this is 3% compounded. Correct. Tell them people, tell the viewers, why is compounded so important? Because it's based on, the 3% is based on the previous year's comp, uh, value of your, um, of, your por of, your, of, your, of your pension. It's not a straight COLA where it's 3% okay. off the original pension. It's but 3 it's 3%, 3 of the, the increment keeps building, exactly. the compounding, well, people like it if you're earning interest and you're earning compounded interest, you're getting lots of income. That's correct. Right? Correct. But on the other hand, if you're a taxpayer and you're paying it out, you're getting lots of liabilities accumulating. That's correct. So, okay. so what, this bill makes, what it they does, reduce the COLA, but it also makes it simple as opposed to compounded. What it's going to do is that it's going to, um, moving forward, and it, it will apply to current retirees. Um, it would be a 3% straight COLA or $750, the lesser of the two, on an annual basis. Um, people are very upset about that. And raising Who's very upset about that? Current retirees, public employees. and They're uh, not happy. No, they're not. And I understand it, but the fact is we're at a situation where the many of our systems have a maybe a 10 to 12 year shelf life left before they're not going to be, be able to make any type of benefit payments to the employees because we cannot sustain the growth of the, uh, of, of, the, of the expenses based on the COLA. Unless and you keep raising taxes a lot because it, you guys, I shouldn't say you, you didn't vote for that tax increase. No, did I didn't. You? No. But it, the state legislature, the General Assembly, raised taxes by about $6 billion a year or two ago, and they barely have a balanced budget now with that increase. When right? the taxes were, were. And they've got still $8 billion of unpaid bills. And so one thing they did is they made the $5 billion pension payment. Basically, folks, they transferred. By raising your taxes 2%, your state income tax, they took money out of your pocket 
okay, five or six billion dollars, and put it into the pocket of state employees. That's correct. Who have it, it was sold to members of the General Assembly and also to the people in the state of Illinois that this tax increase was going to pay down our, our, our outstanding bills. We still have a significant amount, seven or eight billion dollars. Not one penny of it went to it. It went strictly to make a pension payment, which that's about three percent, four percent of the population of the state. And it's we can no longer do it. We're not going to balance and um, you know re reform the pension systems with a tax increase, any further tax increases. What does this do to the retirement age? Does it also adjust that? Well, what it does. Your bill. How, it, how do we refer to that bill? It's the Neckritz Cross bill. And is there a number? To there's it? number. It, there's three different amendments. It, three different bills. One, 1165, I believe, is the House number. bill. 1165. Right. Neckritz Bis bill. Neckritz Cross. Cross, Neckritz, Biss, it's all Standing same concept. Standing for Tom Cross, the Republican House leader, Elaine Neckritz, one of the very involved Democratic House representatives on this pension reform, yeah. and Daniel Biss, currently a state senator, Correct. but he had been in the House, Both. and he's very junior, and he's making, he's, you got to say, Biss is on his way to Biss is a things, very, right? very, he's a good person. I, I, he's a very bright and uh, Jan dedicated. Jan Chikowsky, if you get, if you lose a step, you better watch out, Jan, because yeah. Mr. Biss can be coming for your ninth congressional seat, right? Let me just say this, that uh, Elaine Neckritz and Dan Biss, the fact that they went out in front of this issue, which is not a democratic issue, I give them credit for moving this along because the state finances are so important and so much depend upon us getting a good pension reform package. Now, getting back to the last component to it. one thing, you give it. Tom Cross credit because, as you pointed out, we were talking before the show, Tom really started pushing on this pension reform two, three years ago, right? Tom is the one who raised the issue that we need no longer. he's the Republican House Tom is, is my leader in the House. Tom is the one who has tirelessly for the last three years has been preaching and he's been trying to get some type of pension reform, knowing full well that the systems are going to, one, they're, it's too expensive, they're cutting into our budget, and uh, you know we're not going to, and it's just no longer a sustainable type of system. So, so Tom is the one Tom's the one who started started okay. the whole cry that we got to stop stop business. This is the most important issue of the day. We got to get focused on reforming our our pension systems. So, we, but I wanted to do the retirement age. You okay, I wanted to that. say that what we'll, so we'll do also is that there's a few things that we're, we're talking about with the cola. It's not with a new one. Uh, it will not go into place for five years or the age of 67 for uh, individuals who are going to be new annuitants within the state of Illinois. Uh, but for retirement age, what it also does is that for those who are 45 years or older, public employees, it's not going to make any changes about extending out, pushing out the mm -hmm. retirement age. If you're 40 to 45, it's going to add one year. 35 to 39, three Adding years, one year, 30, your one year. Retirement age, which currently is what? It varies between the different systems. Oh, so depending on the system, you'll now have to retire one year later if Correct. you're 45 or older. To qualify for that pension. But if you're 45, if you're younger than 45, what does it do? If you're younger than 45, we have two different other tiered, uh, tiers. Uh, 35 to 39 pushes it back three years. And if you're 34 years or younger, pushes it back five years, but that's a, over a billion dollars okay. in savings right there. But I think, I think we, I'd like to get back to the COLA because that's okay. where the money sure. is being okay. saved. Right off the, with the, this COLA change, we will right off the top uh, realize about a $21 billion savings taken off the unfunded liability. We believe that within 30 years that we will save $100 billion on our pension system through these COLA adjustments. It's going to be challenged. We expect it. Let's get it done. Let the governor sign the bill. Let it go to the courts and let them make a decision. All the constitutional law experts who have now arisen in the House and the Senate, let's just put it aside. There's seven people who are reside right across the street from us in the state capitol who wear a robe. Makes, that's needs the to make Illinois decision. State Supreme Court? That's correct. And they're going to deal gonna with the, the final decision. They'll make the final the decision. Constitutionality. constitutionality of the, it, mainly it's going to come down to the COLA change for current retirees. Okay. Uh, they're going to cite the impairment clause of the Illinois Constitution, which says you can etch, it's a contractual relationship and we cannot make any changes, uh, and it's a, it's a right, and it's a... Um, because it says some, the language is something to the effect that the, the um, compensation of uh, individuals who work for the state will not be impaired. Is that the phrasing? That's something correct. Something like that? So and and, it, and, and the, it's not that you can't lower the compensation in the future. The argument here would be of the state employees union is that this, this has already... This is something that they feel they've already owned. They own their pension. They're expecting it to get, and you're taking it away. Your argument would be it hasn't yet accrued. Am I right on that? True. It hasn't accrued. So, so not only is it good policy, your argument would be, if I, and, and Jim, you are a lawyer, so you could be making this argument, right? 
Uh, we have made the argument that... Uh, we, but also you, because you're a lawyer. Uh, you know I, something I, about the Illinois sure. Constitution. Would your argument be, if you were making the argument, Jim, I know you may not be arguing it to the Supreme Court, would your argument be that it is constitutional because these benefits have not yet accrued? Well, that's one argument, but I also believe, and I've looked at a few other states that are taking up the same issue that have similar types of impairment clauses. And I'll say Colorado, for one, it's, I believe it's just got passed through the trial court, but they upheld the legislature's readjustment of the COLAs for uh, retirees. And uh, I believe that what the Colorado court said, that reducing a pension benefit to strengthen the overall pension fund is not unconstitutional. But we are not eliminating the COLA. We're making they an may, adjustment. You're still getting yeah. a COLA. But it's a reduced COLA. It's a reduced COLA, absolutely. Okay. But they're still getting a cost and of is the, But is the constitutional provision in the Colorado state, state constitution as strong as in the Illinois constitution vis-a-vis -vis the rights of state employees? I believe, it, believe, is. It, is. I believe so it is. I believe it is. I believe it is. So do you think it's a good analogous precedential, if not precedent, it's a good an analogy to make or a good analogous argument because you're saying they basically are facing similar conditions in Colorado as we're facing in Illinois. Absolutely. The Minnesota. Colorado Supreme Court looking at the Colorado Constitution, which you're saying is similar Very to similar. the Illinois Constitution, they had held it was constitutional. Is, Minnesota, is Minnesota as well, similar where they said okay. that you have a right, inherent right to be able to make adjustments to the cost of living, and uh, but you're not eliminating it, but you have a right and you're not impairing that contract. So yeah. we have to make, we have to move forward. We're not going to make okay. the savings unless we have it done with the retirees. And I, they're very angry. I, I understand that. But this is going to ensure that this pension system will be sustained and viable. They, they will be, they'll, they'll continue to receive their benefit moving forward. Did you say there's an increase in the employee contribution as well or not in this bill? Right now, what's currently uh, passed out of the House, there is not a... There's not an increase no, in the employee contribution? Not yet. Is that because you thought it would be less likely to be constitutional or just not needed in terms of the numbers? Well, um, that's what the Speaker presented to us. So. Speaker Mike Manning. That's correct. But this is known as the Cross... Bis. Cross bis Neckert's bill. Bill, but it's the one that Speaker Mac Madigan decided to allow to go forward and be voted on, right? The Speaker is allowed. Because, uh, let's face it, if Mike Madigan says it can go forward, it can if he says it can't. Because Speaker Mike Madigan is the most powerful politician in the state of Illinois. Is that right? I think he's extremely powerful, yes. Certainly more powerful than the governor's, Pat Quinn. You know, I guess it's a matter of, a, of, of the to the eye of the beholder, speaker I mean, you know, if the speaker says jump and Pat Quinn's there, he's going to say, how high? I don't think that that's the relationship, and I don't think that really? that is. Yeah. So you think they're kind of equals, Governor Pat Quinn, Speaker Mike Maddie? Well, at the end of the day, it's the governor who signs any bill into law. And, yeah, uh, you know, really they can override at times, but the fact is he's you still gonna, need he, to he respect sign, the he'll, executive. He'll sign this bill, Pat Quinn, right? Pat Quinn wants to sign the bill. He's been ready to sign a bill for over a year. Irrespective. I'm just kidding around, Pat. Come on the show. No. We're not being disrespectful. But irrespective of what the speaker wants, Pat Quinn wants this kind of legislation. There's no doubt if this passes the Senate, Pat Quinn will sign it, right? Absolutely. The I, question I, is, will it pass the Senate? Will Senate President John Cullerton allow this bill to be voted on? Because he has his own bill, which is Senate Bill 1, right? That's correct. Which also passed the Senate. It passed this the one Senate. hasn't Just passed barely the passed the Senate. It only affects uh, votes. current teachers, yeah. TRS, okay. not any, any retirees. And his plan uh, basically states if you want to keep your 3% compound of COLA, you give up your uh, health insurance. Did you know the unions are really upset with your bill. They would much prefer his bill for obvious reasons. It impacts them less. The unions are going to pressure Senate President John Cullerton. Unions are, you know, really have a substantial impact on the Democratic Party. They're going to, pre they're going to pressure Democrats, Senate Absolutely. President John Cullerton, not to back down, stick with Senate Bill 1. Do I have that right? I think that that is a fair assessment, but we are, I think and that... And what is, what is Cullerton going to do? Is he going to listen to the unions, or is he going to listen to Speaker Mike Madigan and Representative Jim Durkin? I, I, well, I don't think he's going to listen to me, but I believe that he is, that Senator Cullerton is going to be left with a, a very challenging situation. There's going to be a lot of pressure upon the Senate to pass what we had At sent over. At the end over. of the day, what's he going to do? I, I, Jeff, I don't know. I really don't know. You don't want to make a prediction? No, no, I don't. But I think what, what people need you to realize... You can become a pundit. You could retire no, from the state no. house. You could make $500,000 a year. You can go on Channel 2, 5, and 7, CLTV, 9. You could be famous as a pundit. Screw this stuff. What do you get, $75,000? Right. Forget that. Just yep. show what kind of pundit you could be, Jim. Not interested. Um, so the, uh, But I think what people need to realize also that the public pensions are not subject to state taxation. We have not changed that. So these pensions of every state pension in Illinois, local government, all the way up to the legislature, the governor, they're not subject to taxes in Illinois. But what I think people real, need to realize is that we are continue to be downgraded. Our bond, uh, uh, our, our 
credit rating continues to fall, and that is because of our failure to take on substantial reforms for our public pension system. The last bond deal the state of Illinois put up with about three weeks ago was pulled off the table. It was a half million dollars because the interest rates were too high because of the uh, based okay. on the lack of confidence that the Moody's uh, and S and so the other you're making the argument the business community is really pushing here. We know that Ty Fainer, uh, head of the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club, has been working on this for a year or two. We know that the uh, what Feder Civic Federation has been pushing hard. Both those are very strong business groups. Yes. So they are pushing for this kind of legislation. There's a lot of pressure on Senate President Cullerton to go along and get this done, right? I would say that there will be a lot of pressure over the next next month. Absolutely. Okay. You know, for us to continue, and it's just going to make the cost of right. borrowing we even more expensive, and it's going to force higher taxes. That's why the business community So just a small thing. I was just thinking, so we were talking about you are obviously been practicing law for a number of years. Yes. Right. What, about 25 years or so? So Lisa Maddie, and clearly we'll get to this in a second. She, of course, is the Attorney General, but everybody knows, Lisa, that you're going to decide to run for governor in the Democratic primary. You're going to beat probably Pat Quinn. If Bill Daly stays out of it, you know, he probably will. So Lisa will be the nominee, and there's a vacancy, an open seat, so to speak, for Illinois Attorney General. Jim Durkin, March 23rd, you want to announce on my show? public affairs that you're running for attorney general in the Republican primary? No, but I will say that I would, if there is a vacancy, probably everyone with a law degree in the House and the Senate is going to put their name forward and, and test the waters. But you more than others, but you've already run statewide. You've run for the, you were the Republican nominee for the U.S. Senate seat. You've got 14 years of experience in the state house. Your brother's now recently ascended to the federal judgeship. That's Tom Durkin. That's Everybody correct. was there. Mark Kirk sent a little video in. He couldn't make it. He was going to be there. Patrick Fitzgerald, our U.S. attorneys and a number of judges. It was a really great event. It was like a very bipartisan event. Correct. Your brother's an independent, right? So he had the support yeah. both of Republican Senator Mark Kirk, Democratic Senator, Senior Senator Dick Durbin, not Durkin, but Durbin, okay? With a B. So really, you're, you're, and you're number six in that family. There are eight boys in the Durkin family. Correct. Only, only in terms of edge, not in terms of power, because I heard you were the best basketball player, right? You guys played basketball out there all the well, time, Well, I can right? tell you right now, I was the best basketball player out of the eight, absolutely. Out of, out of the eight, oh, yeah. okay. So by all of that, I would say you're going to be the nominee for Illinois AG, because it really goes to the Republican who's the best basketball player. And is there anybody who plays ball better than you? Wow. Jeff, you've come a long way. <laughs> uh, you know what? I will say this. If there's a vacancy, I'm definitely going to look okay. at it. And I know a few other names right. are being kicked around. I started it, my law career at the Attorney General office. I you were Assistant Attorney General. Assistant State's Attorney General. Attorney. I went to 26th and also Street. State's Attorney. I was a State's Assistant Attorney. Attorney. Spent Cook five County. years at 26th Street trying every imaginable case. And I've been in the private sector for for 15 years trying civil cases involved with just the daily types of uh, issues that come so up. So if in Dillard civil says to you he'll support you for AG if you support him for governor, is that a deal? Can we let's get some deals done here today? We gotta, I gotta make some money. Kirk Dillard's a friend of mine, and you know he came very close, and I thought he would have been a, he'd be the governor of Illinois if he would have won the primary a few years ago. Okay, and you you might support, so you might make that deal to support Kirk. If I have a lot of friends who are who are considering running for for governor. And, well, let's uh, go through that list sure. quickly. Let's see if we can get that list of the Repub potential uh, Illinois Republican governor governor candidates up. The lead guy is Senator Bill Brady, right? Bill's, I'll just say, Bill's a friend of mine. He was at my wedding. He was the Republican ago. nominee. Correct. He almost won against Bill against Pat Quinn. You, 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 he's a friend of yours. Yes, he is. He's a colleague of yours in the General Assembly. Yes, you supporting correct. Bill? I'm not supporting anybody right, right now. Right now, you're staying neutral. Staying neutral. He's a friend, and uh, you know. Also, Treasurer Dan Rutherford. He's a friend of yours. He's a friend of mine as well. We served together in the House. Okay. Yeah. And so I, was, I think it was Eb Dirksen who said, you know, some of my friends support this, some of my friends support that. I support my friends. Is that was that Dirksen? Okay, so let's get that list back up there again. So Brady's running, Rutherford's running, Kirk Dillard, we mentioned the Senator Kirk Dillard, okay, who almost was the nominee. He lost right. that by about 200 votes. No hard feelings. I'm sure he and Bill are good friends, right? Of course, everybody, we're professionals here. Congressman Aaron Schock, Aaron's he may be running. A, Aaron's He's a, a friend, friend of mine. We served Dallas together State. in the House. I, I, I look at... Every one of those uh, gentlemen are friends of mine. Businessman um, Bruce Rauner, is he a friend of yours too? I've met him once. I can't, I don't consider him a friend. I don't know him. Um, I've you're met neutral him to him. You're not opposed. You, 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 you I mean, certainly it, could support him, right? You know what? I'm going to keep my powder dry keep is powder. what I think it's a oh, political. Oh, on WS talk show, Dan Proft, who was also running in the 2010 race, 
Dan's a friend of yours, no doubt, right? I, I'm Dan's an acquaintance. I've have you been on his show? It's on every folks. Remember, we don't plug things, but we have to say, because Dan's been a good guy and come on the show numerous times, that's a great show. It was Don and Roma from 5 to 9 in the morning on WS890 AM radio. Now it's Bruce and Dan. That's Bruce Wolf and Dan Prof, 5 to 9 in the morning, Monday through Friday, 8.90 a.m. If you want to stay up with politics and public policy, it's a must that you listen to that show. And if you want to know what's going on in the pop culture. Right? I've been on the show, on the radio show. You've been show. on the show, too, right? I've been on this radio show, yes. Okay. You like Dan? Dan's a fine man. He's a very, uh, okay. and he's, he's quite a, uh, he's very high-spirited. Here's the, here's the dark horse in that Republican primary. WFLD news anchor, Anna Devlantis. How do you like that? Think that'd be good, I, I, well, You well, know Anna, right? I met her. She's um, one of the 50 prettiest women in Chicago. Well, I would say I, from. It's not a sexist comment. I've, it's already out there. Well, I'm going to say for an, it. Opti for an optics right? perspective, she, she, she clearly wins. Is she one of the 50 wins. prettiest women in, in, the, in, in the Chicago area? Did you say that? She's a very attractive woman. There you go. Not Let's as see. attractive as my wife, though. Uh, this man is so politic, you know, you're so polished, you were ready to run for AG. There you go. Hi. Your wife is at home. She's a beautiful woman. I know you've that. Her, yeah. She's a wonderful woman. She is. Okay. And you've got a great family out Thank there, you. Western Springs. Correct. You represent, in addition to Western Springs, Burr Ridge, LaGrange, uh, Lamont. Lamont. Homer Anybody Glenn. else? Homer, Homer Glenn. Glenn. Okay. Willowbrook. Sure. It's a good base to run on. It's a pretty affluent district. A lot of big donors out there, right? Almost as good as the North Shore, right? <laughs> All right, just kidding around. Well, I don't know if Anna's running, but she's she's a great host and great uh, news anchor. And, and it's very seriously, I've talked to Anna over the years. She knows politics. She knows public policy. Sure. Anna, give us some thought. She'd be the only female in the race. I mean, seriously. It if she knows like the issues. You already signed a contract to run her campaign, Jeff. Well, no, but it would create a vacancy, and then I could replace her as news anchor. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So on the Democratic side, who do we have? We've got to cast Pat Quinn for the state for sure. We just mentioned A.G. Lisa Maddox probably jumps in. And what about Bill Daly? You know, Bill Daly, I think a few months ago, it seemed like uh, it was CS, cool. I just want to make it clear. I should have put that out. CS stands for Commerce Secretary. He was Secretary of Commerce, United States Secretary of Commerce under the, in the Clinton administration, right? right? Uh, the governor's clearly running and the I, election. Oh, here's the dark horse, WTTW's Carol Marine. I wonder who came up with that. But she's probably a Democrat. Look, she'd be the only female. Well, that's not true, see? She has a little tougher race than Anna Diplantis, but she's got to go against Lisa. She'd but everybody, tough. there are people who said she's very good to debate. She's tough. She would be tough, she's, she's, she's right? She's tough. You know, she even Absolutely. debated her on TTW on Chicago Number Tonight. Of Number of Doesn't times. she? You know, basically, folks, I don't want to put this, but she she beats your ass, really. Is that she, too blunt? Yeah. No. Can I say that? Oh, I just did. I guess. Carol Marines, uh, she's a, a tough hose. She gets okay. to the point, and uh, she and would I, make I, a, I have great She would make a good nominee of the Democratic Party for governor, right? I would say we can have two women. We can have Anna Devlantis running against Carol Marine, Democrat and Republican. How would you like that? You're trying to open up a vacancy both with uh, channel uh, WFLD and WTTW. Okay. There you go. I, I got to get some spots. Sure. I got to get some money coming in here. Right. Okay. So, um, look, one thing we got to get serious here for a minute, just on education. Sure. There's a lot in the news about closing of the Chicago of 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 closing of Chicago public schools which would total to about uh, 30,000 students if they go ahead with these closings of, I guess they're mostly K, they are all K through 8, right? And I believe so, yeah. Nobody's talking really about the alternative because they should. Here's the statistic, folks. We'd like to have Barbara Bird Bennett on so she could adjust this, a number of issues, but in particular, my understanding from Robin Staines of AdvancedIllinois.org is that about 20, only 20% 20 of the black fourth graders in CPS, Chicago Public Schools, read at grade level. 80% are reading at below grade level. Isn't that an it's amazing, an absolute tragedy. depressing it's, it's a terrible tragedy. What's going on? What should we do about that? And what should the Republican Party be doing, Jim? Because shouldn't that be like even more important than state employee pension issues? I know that's important. But if you don't substantially ratchet up the number of fourth grade kids, especially black kids, because that's where the problem is, with Hispanics as well. 85% of the kids in the Chicago public schools are Hispanic, or minority, which is mainly Hispanic and black. And Hispanic kids are not far behind in having a, a bad statistic there too. What do we do to get ratchet that up so that not 20%, but reverse that statistic, make 80% of those kids read at grade level? Look, we have, it, it's, it's not as easy as just saying that we're gonna make some changes in state law. I, I've always been a proponent of school choice. Uh, vouchers for parents to make decisions if they believe that their child can get a better education. 
um, whether it's a uh, Catholic or a private school, or even going out of the district, I think that they should have that option. They should have it's, that option because Bar Barack Obama, when his kids were in Hyde Park, they didn't go to the public school. They went to the University of Chicago Lamp School, which has a tuition of about twenty thousand. Barack would say, "Well, he only paid half because you know he he was a state. He 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 was teaching at the University of Chicago, so he would pay half. But still, his kids had school choice." Shouldn't Barack Obama and every Democrat in the state of Illinois want this? If not, it, not everybody can pay the tuition to go to the Chicago Lab School, but at least give them a choice if they're not satisfied with the public school, like Barack wasn't, they could go to a private school. There's Shouldn't school, they have that choice? And that's what you're saying. You support the, that kind of school choice. I support school, school choice in the areas where, the, where there's just the neighborhoods are really challenging for families. The schools are not performing. Kids are just not getting out of school, being prepared for for, for the next uh, next stage, but I yeah. think that in the limited circumstances, Chicago, some other areas in the state of Illinois, I think we need to give that option to the parents because they, if they believe that their child is not getting a good education, they should be given that option. Oh, and you support closing these schools because they say they're not I, closing I, because they're failing, they're low utilization, but many of those are not performing well. And now if you'll have, if you have higher utilization, you can probably improve the schools. If you can't go to school vouchers, if you can't go to charter schools, Closing these non-performing or at least poorly utilized schools, that's probably a good idea. Well, would, you, I guess, would you agree with that? You know what? I can't make, I don't have an opinion on what happened. Okay. Uh, you know, we were dealing with pensions last right. week, but we're talking moving 30,000 kids into new places. Where are they going to go? I got to make sure, you know, I just hope the Chicago Public Schools, and I believe that they understand what they're doing, they have a long range plan, do have a place for these children. And take care and, of them. Hope safe, that, safety issues. Well, if they're going to have to travel further, the CPS should say, we're going to make sure you can go from your home to the school that's further distance safely, right? It is. These At are, very, these are the, the that. world's changed. The world's changed on okay. so many levels. Finances, and you know, we have these okay. poor kids. I mean, they should not have to worry about walking to and from school, of catching a bullet. It, there's so many, so many issues, and, and it's just horrible what these kids in the city of Chicago are going through. We're going to continue to speak as the credits roll, but I very much want to thank our guest, State Representative Jim Durkin. He may be he may be a candidate for Attorney General. Lisa Madigan, she may be moving up or trying to move up. That's a vacancy. You're certainly going to be giving that some thought if that seat's open. And you heard it first here on Public Affairs, right, Jim? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks so much. Always for a pleasure. Coming. Thank you. All right, concealed carry. It's a big issue. This, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals has said that you're the only legislature must pass a concealed carry bill by what, June 8th, right? Correct. March 23rd. What should that concealed carry bill look like? Well, should one, I don't believe it is a, uh, a May permit. It's a shell permit. I've read that uh, opinion uh, and we... Which means? Which means that it's not going to be a, a law that's going to stop at any border of a county or allow for a home rule override. Okay. I think it has to be consistent throughout the state. Everybody and if we don't, have the consequences. Right, everybody should have a right to apply for the right to carry a gun concealed. You might have to take classes, you might have to do this and that, well, but everybody across the state of Illinois, you're saying... Except felons, people who have mental incapacities, right. and a number of other individuals who should not get okay. access to firearms. We have to have reasonable restrictions of where they cannot go. But I will say this, that the consequences of us not passing a law by the first week of, of June are very troubling, because I do believe, and I've talked to a federal judge, uh, I won't make, make his name, but he, and I think a lot of good minds believe that our unlawful use of a weapon statute is null and void after that. Mm -hmm. In this Seventh Circuit, the ones who wrote the opinion, Posner and Flom, aren't fooling around. They're gonna take, they take this very seriously. Is murder in Chicago a way of life? And what should oh, it's be a way about of life. that? It's, it's, it's Why the, is it so much higher in Chicago as a way. portion than New York? Why do we have so much more, gangs, so many more murders? Gangs. Why, is it so, why are gangs so much more of a problem in Chicago than New York? I believe that the New York approach going back to Giuliani was a zero tolerance towards street gangs and gun for gun. So Giuliani had the right idea there as a U.S. attorney? Is I that believe that he, the... Should the U.S. attorney here be doing something there should about be, that? I believe that every law enforcement office in the state of Illinois at local, state, and